In the decades to follow the 1931 University of Chicago dig at the Player Mound Group, the world around was in upheaval. The United States had gradually clawed its way out of the Great Depression, only to find itself again plunged into another horrific world war for a second time in less than 25 years. Shortly after World War II ended, Milton Player was to retire from farming at the age of 73 in 1947. The steadfast dairy farmer and solid citizen passed away just 10 years later in 1957, and he was followed in death by his wife of 62 years, Elizabeth Reed Player, who passed away in 1960. Milton and Elizabeth Player were buried in Glen Oak Cemetery in West Chicago. It was shortly after this time that the DuPage County Forest Preserve, founded in 1915, began to realize that their county's land resources were fast disappearing with the rapid suburbanization of the Chicago metropolitan area. So they began to act with aggressive acquisition of open county land. Between 1969 and 1973 alone, they acquired almost 7,400 acres, which was almost 30% of the total land acquisitions made by the Forest Preserve District from 1915 to 2018. Among these land purchases were over 330 acres for the newly formed Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve, including 72 acres of what remained of the player farm, encompassing the ancient mound site just to the west of the DuPage River. In January of 1975, James Jennings decided to take advantage of a warm and wet break in the winter weather, and so took his son for an outing at the newly formed Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve, just a few miles west of where he lived in Wheaton, Illinois. As they slogged through the mud and slippery pathways, Jennings noticed flint chips on the ground along the western bluff of the DuPage River. Most people might have kept on walking, especially given the dreary conditions of the day. But as James Edward Jennings was a professor of archaeology at nearby Wheaton College, the quantity of flakes along the path suggested to him that the area was used for stone tool making, such as for projectile points, hand drills, and scrapers by Native Americans. And so he wondered whether the site might yield much more. Jennings, who hailed from West Virginia, held bachelor's and master's degrees from Wheaton College, and who had been on numerous archaeological expeditions to the Middle East, contacted the Illinois Archaeological Survey at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, outlining his initial findings and proposing to dig the site under their sponsorship and collaboration. The Illinois Archaeological Survey, which had renumbered the Illinois archaeological sites in the 1950s, agreed and gave their blessing to excavate DU-33, which included the mounds and possible village site. During the planning process, Jennings also obtained a copy of the unpublished Newman Report from 1931, detailing the earlier excavation of the DU-1 mound. By early spring of 1975, Jennings put together an excavation plan using his spring semester archaeology class and formally filed for a permit with the DuPage County Forest Preserve District, with the project to start on Tuesday, April 15th, and to be completed less than eight weeks later, by Friday, June 6. The Wheaton College Winfield excavation was to be led by Jennings, with most of the muscle for the operation to be provided by his undergraduate archaeology class in a field school operation, with Kenneth Hogland, an upperclassman, as the project's assistant director. Students were to file their own individual reports along with daily excavation logs, measurements, and fine records for grade for their spring semester. The Wheaton College project had three stated goals. First, to conduct an area site survey with no digging to establish an occupational pattern for the area along both sides of the west branch of the DuPage River, from Geneva Road to High Lake Road in Winfield, Illinois. Second, to conduct excavations on the presumed village site along the banks of the DuPage River, with the goal of establishing the extent and type of the habitation. And third, to check over the previous 1931 U of C mound dig, and then to excavate a second mound. For the first goal of their project, the site survey, the team used the standard archaeological method of field walking, 
and non-invasive method, which involves systematic walking along the area to be investigated, looking for lithics, such as arrowheads, ceramics, or bits of broken pottery, and worked bone and shell sitting atop the exposed ground. Finds are then carefully recorded and plotted by location, which generally yields information as to habitation and usage by previous inhabitants. This is contrasted to when artifacts are picked up by people out for a walk, or even by pot hunters. Even if the artifacts are later brought to an archaeologist, unless the original location of the artifact was precisely and accurately recorded, the artifact by itself provides little information, since the original context and location of the find are lost to the archaeologist. The Wheaton College team surveyed on the east side of the DuPage River near Geneva Road to the north, and here they found a few projectile points, numerous chert fragments, the waste from making projectile points, as well as some pieces of pottery. They dated the artifacts to the middle and late woodland areas, which the U.S. archaeological community has established as time periods which showed cultural cohesion relative to tool manufacture, textile manufacture, settlement practices, mortuary practices, and so on. The Middle Woodland period has generally dated to 200 BCE to 500 CE, while the Late Woodland period covers the time frame of 500 CE to 1000 CE. Moving south along the east banks of the DuPage River yielded no finds for the team, although they had a great deal of difficulty walking through the lower marshy areas which also suggested unlikely habitation. On the west side of the river, the team moved southward from Geneva Road, finding little but also hampered by the tall grasses, which greatly reduced visibility of surface finds. By the time they reached the bluff area, however, their luck changed, and they started to find large numbers of flint or chert fragments all along the riverside pathway for a distance of hundreds of feet just as James Jennings had done a few months earlier, again suggesting that the area was used for extensive stone tool manufacture. They also found an unfinished projectile point, as well as a lap anvil. As they continued to move south along the river into the lower and marshy areas towards High Lake Road, the finds dropped off significantly. The team also conducted field walking exercises to the southwest of the bluff area hundreds of feet to the west of the river, using the aid of a local Boy Scout troop. And here they found another concentration of chert fragments, as well as a fine example of a middle woodland projectile point with notched corners, suggesting another possible habitation location. Although, due to time considerations, they were unable to explore this region further in their two seasons of excavation. The second part of the Wheaton College Winfield excavation was to focus on test excavations along the bluff area, where they had found so many lithic fragments, strongly suggesting a stone tool manufacture zone. These excavations were to yield results beyond their expectations. They initially established a four by four grid of six foot by six foot squares, separated by 1.5 foot walkways, close by a pathway that ran along the river bluff. The squares were then divided into three foot by three foot quadrants, and 16 of the 64 quadrants, or 25%, were randomly sampled for excavation. Their excavations included carefully trawling off the selected quadrants, recording stratification and finds, and screening the resulting dirt spoil for small artifacts. As the grid system was right along a well-used pathway, they also had to contend with hikers, horse riders, and trail bike riders, who routinely came through the area, with the trail bike riders in particular causing disruption of their dig. On at least two occasions, they returned to their unguarded bluff trenches to find their grid stakes pulled up, their tarps, barriers, and screening tools all removed and thrown into the river. Trail bike prints in their carefully dug quadrant squares betrayed the perpetrators. On both occasions, valuable time was consumed in retrieving the materials from the river and accurately reestablishing their grid system. Perhaps in frustration due to the constant disruptions of their bluff grid along the pathway, they opened two new shallow six-foot by six-foot trenches a few tens of feet west of the pathway, 
which yielded some pottery fragments, as well as stone tool fragments. A few weeks later, as a result of surface finds north of their bluff grid, they decided to open another trench. They localized the concentration of surface finds to a short segment along the bluff pathway, which was disturbed ground inadvertently opened up by the trail bike riders. Here, about 90 feet north of the grid, they opened up a shallow trench, about seven feet by three feet in size and several inches in depth. And in quick order, were surprised to find a large cache of pottery fragments, most small and deteriorated, but more than 1,500 in number. They conjectured that they had stumbled upon a pottery dump, typically referred to as a midden by archeologists, a place where earlier inhabitants had routinely disposed of their debris, including broken pottery. To get a better understanding of this midden, they opened yet another shallow trench, just a few feet south and west of the initial midden trench, this time creating a 10 foot by 10 foot grid and proceeding to excavate three of the four quadrants to a depth of several inches below the surface. Here again, they found pottery fragments, although in much less quantity than the first midden trench, as well as a finely worked triangular projectile point. Overall, their bluff excavations indicated at least two levels of occupation, all found within the first 10 inches of the surface. The first occupation layer was about three to five inches below the surface, where they found large numbers of pottery sherds and shirt fragments. The second occupation layer was about 9 inches to 10 inches below the surface, where they found a significant layer of chert flakes. Based on pot sherds and ceramics, they dated the main occupation layer, which was about 3 to 5 inches below the surface, as being late woodland, or 500 CE to 1000 CE. The deeper occupation layer, at 9 to 10 inches, was more difficult to date, as the finds included no ceramics, although the stratification suggested a middle woodland date. As the third and final act of the 1975 Wheaton College Winfield excavation, the team turned their attention to the player mounts, a little more than 100 yards to the west of their bluff site excavations. In spite of the mount site proximity, the team had difficulty in locating them, due to the heavy undergrowth that had overwhelmed the site since the 1931 excavations, which at that time had been a more open forest setting. The area was so overgrown, in fact, that they had to rely on Newman's 1931 survey to finally locate the mounds. After checking over the three mounds, they decided to focus their efforts on DU-2, also known as Player Mound Group 2, which was the southernmost mound as it appeared to be the least damaged and the most accessible for excavation. They noted Mr. Cook's one and a half foot deep trench from the 1920s in the north face of the mound, which had eroded into a significant scar, and so decided to focus on the south half of the mound. Much effort was then undertaken in simply clearing the mound site area of undergrowth, including small trees, as it greatly inhibited their excavation activities. Like the University of Chicago team before them, they then set up a grid system of five foot squares, with five squares in the southwest quadrant forming a large L shape, and three squares in the southeast quadrant forming a small L shape, with a two foot gap between the two sets of trenches. They labeled the centermost row of squares running west to east as E1, E2, E3, E4, and E5. The next row to the south was labeled F3 and F4, while the third and southernmost grid square was labeled G3. They also dug a single 3 foot by 3 foot test pit, approximately 30 feet northwest of the center of DU2, about 15 feet beyond the mound border. They then began to trowel off layers in each of the squares at 6 inch increments, looking for artifacts or features, while also carefully noting the soil stratigraphy of the enfolding profile as they cut down into the mound. Unlike the University of Chicago team, they did use screening of the spoil to look for smaller artifacts, at least part of the time when the soil was conducive to passing through the screens. In each of the squares and square quadrants, they dug down to varying levels in an attempt to accurately capture stratigraphy, features, and profiles. The deepest pits were dug in the center of the mound with depths of three feet, four feet, and as deep as seven feet in the centermost quadrants of the mound. 
Shallower one-foot cuts were made in the outermost quadrants to the east, west, and south. Although the Wheaton College team had high expectations and hopes of finding a burial or burial chamber in DU2, in the end, they found no evidence of burials or tangible artifacts in terms of diagnostic pottery or stone tools. They did, however, accurately map the stratigraphy of the mound, showing the first few inches to be of typical forest loam, followed by a two-foot layer of brownish clay, which included some chert fragments as well as pieces of red ochre, likely naturally occurring. They believed that this two-foot layer of clay represented the mound construction layer, based on their single test pit. Below this was a distinct black soil with limestone and decomposing organic material, possibly being the original ground surface prior to the construction of the mound. Below this was a one foot thick layer of heavy clay, sand, gravel mixture, followed by a one foot thick stone layer, and then a one foot thick white sand and stone layer. They conjectured that the lowest two layers were glacial in origin, Part of the glacial moraine laid down in this area more than 10,000 years ago. In the final days of the 1975 season, the team focused on taking final measurements, creating detailed stratigraphies of the various trenches, and backfilling the excavations along the bluff. Having at least partially achieved their goals for the excavation project, they wrapped up the 1975 dig season, with the students writing their individual reports for grade and completing their spring semester work. Months later, as the autumn semester was in full swing at Wheaton College, news of the college dig began to circulate on campus. The November 7th edition of the Wheaton College newspaper, The Record, published a story regarding the excavation, using Professor Jennings as a primary source. Weeks later, the news spread beyond the campus, with newspaper articles appearing in numerous DuPage County newspapers, as well as the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times, the latter leading with a rather embarrassing article title. Chicagoland News was afire with the prospect of an ancient Native American site along the DuPage River, and in the days before the Internet, local newspapers were the primary means by which news and topics trended. The DuPage County Forest Preserve District was generally pleased with the finds and stories circulating about the Wheaton College dig. However, they were not happy that they had yet to receive any official report on the findings, as was required as part of the permit. Somehow, however, tensions were alleviated, and they agreed to extend the Wheaton College permit for an additional season, with the new project starting on April 15th and going until the middle of June 1976. As this was an extension of the original permit, the project goals remained the same and Jennings planned to use the same field school operations for the 1976 season. Perhaps realizing that they had overstretched themselves in 1975, Jennings set more modest goals for the upcoming 1976 field season, this time focusing entirely on the possible village site and specifically attempting to gauge the size of the settlement area. And so his team first set about creating a new set of test pits along the bluff area, this time creating 10 excavation pits in a linear ladder pattern running north-south and about 40 feet south of the original bluff grid that they had set up in the 1975 season. In this ladder pattern, they set up 10 5 by 5 foot squares separated by 5 foot walkways, the entire grid extending 95 feet in all. Once staked out, the students began excavating each of the test pits carefully trawling off the soil and recording the finds. Unlike the 1975 dig, however, they did not dig down beyond the main occupation layer identified in 1975, going no further than four to five inches below the surface. As with the 1975 dig, these bluff excavation pits yielded many pottery sherds and chert flakes at the main occupation level of about four inches below the surface, indicating that the occupation zone stretched all along this 95-foot linear grid. This taken together with the multiple 1975 trenches along the bluff established that the occupation zone along the west bluff of the DuPage River was at least 200 feet north to south and at least a few tens of feet to the west. Further, 
By analyzing the ceramics and pottery shirts found during the excavation, they confirmed that the primary occupation dates were in the Middle Woodland time frame and the Late Woodland time frame, from 300 BCE to 1000 CE. Meanwhile, news of the dig continued to trend across the Chicago metropolitan area, with stories appearing in local newspapers. Towards the end of the 1976 season, WBBM-TV, or Channel 2 as it was known then, did a special story on the dig, devoting a full six-minute segment to the Wheaton College excavation, led by popular anchorman Bill Curtis and featuring interviews with James Jennings and a few of his students. It takes two to bring it back alive. With the whirlwind of media attention ebbing, the Wheaton College team focused on taking final measurements photographs, and the recording of finds. The project wrapped up by the middle of June 1976. DU-33 slowly returned back to nature and to being a haunt of trail bike riders. The artifacts collected by the Wheaton College DU-33 dig from 1975 and 1976 have been thankfully preserved by the college for the past 45 years. Most recently, they've been lent to the Anthropology Department at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, where to this day they are being further cataloged and studied. Peter Geraci, a specialist in the Archaeology Department of the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, who has been studying the artifacts from the Wheaton College dig over the past few months, has been kind enough to provide us with an overview of the Wheaton College excavation artifacts of both the lithics or stone tools and the ceramics or pottery. Here we have a representative sample of pottery from the Winfield Mound site. On your upper left hand corner you see what we call Naples stamped dentate. And what they do is they take a reed or another piece of wood and create a pattern of dentates. So each one of these is considered a dentate. And what they do is they roll the edges, usually around the rim, uh, with these uh, dentate stamps. And they stamp it all around the vessel or in zoned areas. So some areas will be smooth and other areas will have the dentate. In the middle here we have a woodland style cord marked pottery. You can see the grooves on the exterior of the pottery. Here's a picture of the inside uh, where you can see the, the grit and the inclusions in the clay that make up the pot. On the upper right hand corner here we have what we consider um, a rim shirt. Uh, it's got the top of the rim of the vessel here along with um, some more stamped dentates. The bottom right hand corner and this middle one are likely from the same pot. Uh, they look to be different colors, however that may be a result of um, post-depositional processes or maybe difference in the amount of heat that each side got while um, being fired. So this is a piece of collared ware which is later than the stamped dentate and what we consider probably late woodland uh, for the time and area. Uh, you can see there here that they're still using a uh, black mafic grit, um, which is a black rock, black granitic rock, that's used to um, help support the clay in the firing process. Lastly, on the left here, you have a, another stamped dentate, which uh, we consider to be middle woodland, and uh, it's a little bit reddish in color and might have had um, some heat treatment to it, or uh, perhaps expose um, a lengthy exposure to heat. Okay, so what we have here is all the diagnostic points from the Winfield Mound site. This first point is a small corner notch point with a convex base. It's made from Silurian chert and it was likely heat treated. Uh, the edges are serrated. It's 
got a large step platform on one edge there. Uh, this is likely a manufacturer defect, but was likely uh, used um, later on as a way to uh, position your thumb as you used it to cut or saw uh, with that serrated edge. Uh, this was likely um, hafted onto a wooden shaft and used as a knife or a, a spear or dart point. Uh, this point is very similar to the previous point. It's a small corner notch point. Um, it's made out of Solarian shirt that's been heat treated. Um, I can tell that by the red coloration on uh, both sides. Um, this was done uh, intentionally sometimes. Sometimes it was done uh, after it was discarded. Uh, this likely was intentionally um, done to improve the flaking quality of the point. Um, you can see some diagonal uh, or diagonal uh, flakes coming across the uh, top there from one edge to the other. Um, these are some cruder uh, looking bifaces. Uh, they probably were not used as projectile points. Uh, they're both made out of the same material, a Silurian shirt. Um, the one in my left hand uh, was likely remade into a drill after it was used as a knife. Um, or some kind of punch or awl uh, and then discarded once it became no longer um, sharp. It probably was much larger originally and then it was whittled down uh, to that size. Uh, this next point uh, begins our uh, Madison Triangular um, diagnostic bifaces. These are what we uh, consider true arrowheads. Uh, the tip of this one is broken off, actually. Um, it's got a convex base. Um, it was pr probably made from Silurian chert. Um, if we pick it up, uh, we can see that it has a very thin cross section um, and a slightly convex base there. You can see that it has a much thinner uh, cross section um, than one of the corner notch points, meaning that it would have been a much better um, projectile point and would have required a, a smaller haft. Um, here is a, a cruder looking triangular uh, point. Uh, it's got many step fractures um, on the surface there, meaning that the material probably wasn't a very good quality, so it was very hard to remove big clean flakes um, and so they would stack up. Uh, this next point is a great example of what we consider a, a true Madison triangular point. So it was made off of a single flake. Uh, it's very thin and then was come back with some pressure flaking to make that edge razor sharp. Uh, this one was probably also made from Solarian chert. Uh, this next one is unique because it was made from Galena Chert, uh, which is a material that's found near the Star of Rock area along the Illinois River Valley. Uh, it's got a convex base um, and um, is a very fine quality material. Uh, you can see the white fossils in it. Um, this one is a little bit thicker in cross section than the one I just showed you, uh, but still um, a really nice uh, point and would have made a great uh, end to an arrow. Uh, lastly, this point um, is a drill or was made into a drill. It may have been a, a side notch point or a quarter notch point at one point in time, um, but was whittled down into this uh, T-shaped cross section. Um, and then there would have been a, a drill bit extending out um, from there, but it was likely broken off um, after it was deposited or maybe during use. Uh, so there we have uh, the Winfield Mounds Lithics collection. Um, representative of about a thousand year period of time of Native American history in Illinois, um, really representative of the uh, area and um, a nice bit of data for archeologists who uh, don't have a lot of uh, information from this time period uh, in Northern Illinois. Almost two years after the 1976 field season of the Wheaton College Winfield excavation wrapped up, the DuPage Forest Preserve District grew impatient with the long overdue report on the 1975 and 1976 excavations. The assemblage of the excavation data, results, and interpretations fell on the shoulders of young Kenneth Hoagland, 
the assistant director, who managed to deliver a comprehensive report to the Forest Preserve District on September 30, 1978, ultimately to the satisfaction of the Forest Preserve District. James Jennings continued teaching at Wheaton College while conducting major archaeological projects in the Middle East and also obtaining his doctorate in history from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1988. In the early 1990s, however, Dr. Jennings shifted his focus from archaeological projects to humanitarian efforts by forming and presiding over the Conscience International Foundation, which organizes aid to refugees and people in need throughout the world. Kenneth Hoagland, continued on for his Master of Arts degree and doctorate at Duke University. In 1990, Dr. Hoagland joined the teaching staff at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, where he continues as a professor of religion. By all accounts, the Wheaton College excavations followed all standard archaeological methods of the day. They did all the right things in terms of surveying, staking, excavating, screening, sampling, and recording of finds. But times and archaeological standards have changed since the mid-1970s. Today, digging into a burial or effigy mound would require an extraordinarily good scientific reason, as well as the sensitivities to the Native American community that must needs be taken into account. And although there was some backfilling of the mound trench, the fact remains that a major depression remained in the south face of the DU-2 mound until the 1990s. Neither James Jennings nor any of his students ever submitted a paper on the Winfield excavation to a scientific journal. And so like George Newman's 1931 draft report, the scientific details of the excavations at Winfield Mound site were never peer reviewed and never got far beyond a handful of Illinois archeologists. And so in the end, The net result of two major excavations to the Winfield Mound site from the 1930s and 1970s, with open wounds remaining, had yielded no published results in the scientific journals or in the archaeological world. But all of that was to change in the decades to follow. In the next episode of this series, we will tell you how the site excavation information was finally published and how the scars of several digs, both amateur and professional, were finally healed. (laughs) 